Ladies and gentlemen, let's start with the next panel because it's an exciting one and we have inherited five minutes delay, so we need to get going. The next topic is life uh, below zero, bank lending under negative policy rate. It's quite an exciting topic. This is a new monetary policy tool uh, which does not have a proven track record yet. There is uh, not much academic research on it. And it's also a controversial tool, uh, not so much perhaps as to its effectiveness, which is still being studied, but in particular when it comes to the next step uh, of the transmission mechanism and whether it is legally possible and economically appropriate to pass it on to, negative, to, to, to the customers, the negative rates. Um, the fact that negative yields can also arise in a negative rates environment for certain bonds uh, has also been raised by the German Constitutional Court recently to the European Court of Justice, wondering whether uh, buying bonds that have a negative yield does not in fact amount to uh, financing government. Now all these issues are not for us today. Today we are focusing on uh, an important aspect of this uncharted territory, which is how the policy rate transmits in the economy in a situation of negative rates. On this topic, we will hear Glenn Shepard. Uh, uh, he will present the paper he has authored together with Florian Haider and Farth uh, Saidi. Glenn is uh, uh, an economist in the Financial Research Division of the ECB, and um, his primary research interest is uh, financial intermediation, banking, and financial regulation. So obviously he was attracted by this uh, particular topic. And before joining the ECB, he worked in the National Bank of Belgium, obtained a PhD in, the, uh, in economics in Ghent. And uh, his work has been published in many places, but among others in the Journal of Financial Economics. And then as discussant, we are very lucky to have uh, uh, and to welcome here Wouter de Haan, who is since uh, 2011 Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics and is co-director of the Center for Macroeconomics and program director of the Center for Economic Policy Research of the CEPR. Uh, Professor Hahn obtained a PhD at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh in 91 and then moved to California, as many people do, but uh, <laughs> to San Diego where he started as assistant professor and became professor in 2001. And then he held positions in many places, must be a frequent traveler, so London yeah. Business School, University of Amsterdam, and served also as editor of the Economic Journal of Economic, uh, and the Journal of Economic Dynamics and Control. So um, his research focusing on macroeconomic models and heterogeneous agents, I'm sure he will be very qualified to discuss this uncharted territory presentation. And without further ado, I give the floor to Glenn. Thanks, Chiara, for this nice introduction. So good morning, everyone. So in the next 30 minutes, I'll be talking about uh, our paper on bank lending under negative policy rates. As Chiara already mentioned, this paper is joint work with Florian Heiter, who's also uh, at the research department here in the ECB, and with Farzad Saidi, who's at Stockholm School of Economics. And given that Florian and I are at the ECB, the usual disclaimer applies. These are our views and not necessarily those one of the European Central Bank. Now, as the title already um, indicates, in this paper we're really very much interested in whether negative rates are anything special. So in whether um, bank lending behavior under, uh, in times of negative policy rates is anything different from times of, of, of positive rates. Second, we're also very much interested in if this the, in, if, in, uh, if this the case, uh, why is this the case? What are the mechanisms behind this change in behavior. And then third, we're, uh, we also want to learn something what, about what the potential consequences might be uh, for firms, for borrowers, and for, for their investment behavior, and for uh, ultimately for the real economy. But before going uh, deeper into all this, let me first uh, talk a little bit about uh, the motivation for this paper, about uh, why we think these are very interesting questions to ask. So. Um, uh, I'm sure that a lot of you or, or everyone here is aware of the fact that monetary policy has been an uncharted territory for quite a while now. So ever since the 07 uh, financial crisis, a lot of central banks have resorted on non-standard monetary policy tools, such as large-scale uh, asset purchases forward and forward guidance in order to revamp the, the post-crisis economy in order to get back to uh, inflation targets. Some central banks, such as the ECB, but also uh, the Riggs Bank in Sweden, the Swiss National Bank, and a number of others, uh, have uh, even moved policy rates into a negative territory, while others have either implicitly or explicitly uh, spoken out um, against it. So this seems to be a somewhat uh, controversial uh, issue. And on top of that, 
while by now we have um, quite some uh, interesting papers and a fast-growing literature on the impact of large-scale asset purchases on, uh, on bank lending behavior, we still know very little about the actual impact of, of negative rates. And that's exactly where this paper comes in. So in this paper, as I uh, already mentioned, we're, we're very much interested in whether the transmission of bank lending is anything different during times of negative rates, why this might be the case, and what the potential benefits and costs, costs might be, both for banks but also for borrowers and their investment behavior. So let me immediately give you uh, the main takeaways of our, uh, of our paper, and then for the remainder of the presentation, I'll, uh, I'll focus on uh, explaining how we got to these conclusions. So first, and, the, and, and definitely the most important finding in this paper, is that the transmission of negative rates indeed seems to be somewhat special. So it seems to depend a lot on a bank's funding structure. So what we show uh, in, in this paper is that banks that rely more on deposits to, uh, to fund their activities have a high incentive to uh, increase their risk taking and reduce their lending compared uh, to banks that rely on other sources of funding. And importantly, we do not find such an effect for low but negative rates. So this uh, impact or this effect that kicks in due to the deposit funding is really something that is uh, specific to times of negative rates. And I'm going to talk a lot more in a couple of minutes about uh, the exact mechanisms uh, behind this. But allow me to already uh, mention that a lot of this will have to do with the fact that there seems to be a very hard uh, zero lower bound for customer deposit rates. So banks seem to be uh, very reluctant to charge negative rates on uh, customer deposits. And this will lead that, uh, during periods of, to the fact that, uh, and this will lead to um, a funding cost disadvantage for uh, banks relying a lot on uh, deposits during times of negative rates, which will, um, um, which will uh, in the end eat in, into their net worth and lead to an increase in risk taking and a, redu and a reduction in lending for these, uh, for these type of banks. Now, so once we've established uh, these, uh, these findings, we try to dig, dip, dig a bit uh, deeper and uh, talk a bit more about uh, how these risks are effectively materializing and what the impact is for the real economy. Now, we have a lot of results on this uh, in the paper, and I'm not going to go through, uh, through all of them here, but uh, allow me to, to pick a couple of them uh, out, of, uh, out here. So, um, first of all, um, one of the things we observe is that while high deposit banks indeed seem to lend less and take on more risks, they also seem to focus on new risky borrowers. So borrowers that were not active in the market that we're studying before rates uh, became, uh, became negative. And this already seems to indicate that there might be some uh, bright side to this increase in, in risk taking once rates become uh, negative, namely that banks that, are, were, um, that were more um, constrained in the past uh, now seem to be able to uh, get access to uh, bank loans. Uh, second, another, uh, another finding here is that we observe that safe borrowers seems to be switching to low deposit banks, while uh, more risky borrowers seems to switch to, uh, to high deposit banks. So there seems to be a change in the matching between firms and banks, which might have important uh, implications for, uh, uh, for financial stability. And third, what we also observe is that the, uh, the borrowers that are, or the new borrowers in our data set that are uh, effectively getting the loans, uh, are also using these loans to increase uh, investments and not, for example, to build up uh, cash buffers. Now, where does this uh, place us in the, in the existing literature? I'm not going to go through uh, all these papers here. Just allow me to say that um, apart from the, the, the new and quickly emerging literature on, on negative rates and their impact on bank lending, we're also very, very closely related to a longer strand of literature on the transmission of policy, uh, positive policy rates on both bank lending and bank risk taking, and to a more recent strand of papers that looks at the impact of uh, non-standard mo monetary policy on, uh, on bank lending. Now, for the remainder of this presentation, what I'm going to do is first talk a bit more about the hypothesis development uh, uh, for this paper and the framework that we have in the back of our minds when trying to answer these questions. Then I'm, uh, shortly, I'll shortly go over the data and some identification issues, and then I'll walk you through uh, the main results of the paper. So, first hypothesis development. And just to make absolutely sure that we're all uh, on the same page here in terms, of, in terms of context for this paper, let me put up this chart, which I'm sure that a lot of you are very familiar with, uh, and shows the uh, evolution of 
the three main policy rates in the Eurozone and the Ionia, so the uh, uh, overnight interbank rate. So from top to bottom, we have the marginal lending facility rate, the MRO rate, then the Ionia, the interbank rate, and then the deposit facility rate. And what we'll be especially interested in in this paper is the moment that the uh, deposit facility rate uh, becomes uh, negative, so uh, around, so that's in June 2000. Uh, 14 and during this period this deposit facility rate is effectively the main policy rate due to the fact that there's lots of excess liquidity in the system and, and this is for example uh, illustrated here by the fact that the Ionia is very closely following this deposit facility rate during this period. So what we're going to do in this paper is basically compare uh, bank lending behavior before and after this, uh, this dip into a negative uh, territory or during the, the period of negative rates. Now, what's the, um, uh, the analytical framework that we have in the back of our mind when trying to answer these questions? Well, first of all, we think it's uh, very important to remember that bank risk-taking uh, highly, is highly dependent on, um, on a bank's uh, net worth. So a lot of theoretical models out there um, um, see banks as institutions that have opaque assets which require uh, costly screening and monitoring. And um, importantly, when a bank has... Uh, um, doesn't have much skin in the game, so when its net worth is, is low, there will be a lot of uh, moral hazard and, and agency problems around, which will lead to lower screening incentives for, uh, these, uh, for these banks, and which will lead to a more uh, risky uh, investments on the asset side. At the same time, uh, and interestingly enough, we can also think about bank lending as being an, a function of uh, net worth. So basically, the literature on the external finance uh, premium uh, applied to applied to banks. So typically, a lower net worth will lead to uh, a reduction in uh, bank lending due to the fact that this lower net worth will uh, will typically lead to higher external financing premium, making it harder for the bank to get access to external funding to uh, to f uh, to finance these new uh, loans. So the the main takeaway for this um, for this slide is that we can easily think about bank lending and both bank risk taking as being a function of uh, net worth, which makes it easier to think about the impact of monetary policy on on these uh, on both on both lending and risk taking. So, putting it very generally, um, monetary policy will typically affect the bank's net worth via two ways: via an asset side channel and liability side channel. So, on the asset side, a reduction in policy rate reduces loan rates and in that way reduces net worth. On the liability side. The reduction in policy rates will also reduce the cost of funding, and in this way, increase the net worth. So, in normal times, we typically think about this as a liabil the liability side uh, dominating, because banks typically engage in maturity transformation, so they have short-term liabilities and long-term assets, making this liability side dominate during uh, times of positive uh, policy rates. However, and very importantly, there's something um, particular going on when rates uh, become negative. And this is that this liability channel um, uh, will be uh, shut down or will be partly shut down for banks that mainly rely on deposit uh, funding. And the simple reason for that is, um, is that there seems to be a very hard uh, zero lower bound for, uh, for deposit rates. So this graph um, shows the evolution of the overnight uh, deposit rates for non-financial companies, the overnight deposit rates for households, and for the Ionia between 2009 and, and 2016. So the um, solid line is, is the rate for, uh, for non-financial companies, the, the dashed line is the rate for, uh, for households, and, and the dotted line is the Ionia. So what we're interested in, in, is, in is in what's happening around uh, June, uh, June 2014, because there we see that while the Ionia uh, keeps following the deposit facility rate that is going below zero around that point, the deposit rates uh, flatten out above zero, above zero, just above zero. So there seems to be a very hard zero lower bound for customer deposit rates. Now this has very important uh, implications for the, for the channels that I was just describing because it means that the liability side channel will be shut down for banks that mainly rely on, uh, on deposits to fund their activities. So these banks will uh, not benefit from a reduction in their cost of funding and hence will experience a relative reduction in uh, in their net worth, which will lead to higher risk-taking incentives and less lending by these high uh, deposit banks. So what we're going to do in this paper uh, to, wrap this, to wrap this part up is simply compare the lending by banks with different extents of deposit funding before and after policy rates became uh, negative. 
Um, and what we expect to see is that for high deposit banks, relative to low deposit banks, a decrease in, the, in their net worth, which leads to a relative decrease in their lending and an increase in their, in their risk taking. And let me stress here that the, the word relative is very important here. So all the results that I'll be showing throughout uh, the remainder of the of this talk uh, should be interpreted as um, uh, an, an impact on high deposit banks compared to or relative to a group of, of low uh, deposit banks, banks that rely on different sources of, of funding. Now, um, in terms of the, the data that we're using, um, so we're mainly, re we're going to be looking at uh, syndicated loans. So we're using a deal scan to get the syndicated loan data. So the firms in this, in this data set will match with Amadeus to get information on the balance sheets and the profit and loss accounts of these firms. We do the same thing for, uh, for the banks that are granting the loans, but therefore we use uh, SNL data. And we'll do this for uh, the period January 2013 till de December 2015 for the main part of our analysis. In robustness checks, we even go back to 2011. So all the data on the loan side will be on the, on the monthly level. The other data is on the, on the yearly level. The um, baseline measure of, of risk taking uh, that we'll be using uh, throughout our main analysis is the ex ante profit volatility of the firms that are getting the loan. So for each uh, loan that we observe in this deal scan database, we will calculate a proxy for its, for its riskiness by um, looking at the volatility of the profits of the firm that is getting the loan during the five years before the loan is, is being is granted. Uh, and the exposure to treatment in our, in our setup will be the deposit or the average deposit to asset ratio of the banks in the syndicate that are granting the loan and that uh, in 2000, at the end of 2013, so the moment just before uh, rates became, uh, became negative. Now the empirical setup then um, then looks as as follows. So we're, we'll be having we'll be uh, using a, a fairly standard difference and difference specification. With on the left hand side we'll have our risk or lending variable of interest, and on the right hand side, our main coefficient of interest will be the beta one, which is the coefficient for the interaction term between uh, the deposit ratio and uh, and a dummy equal to one during the period of of negative rates. Now, when estimating this, uh, this type of uh, regressions, one runs into a number of identification challenges. And here, there's basically two main identification challenges. So first of all, um, monetary policy also typically affects a firm's demand for loans. So for example, simply think about uh, a net worth channel or an external finance premium channel that is there uh, at, the, at the firm side. So lower rates leading to uh, an increase in the net worth of firms leading to uh, a potential increase in, in loan demand. So this might bias uh, our estimates of uh, what, how the, the change in policy rate really uh, impacts the, uh, the supply of loans by, uh, by banks. And secondly, uh, monetary policy also obviously reacts to, to economic conditions. So it's, uh, it's very, uh, very likely that the reduction in rates uh, was is being done due to the fact that the economy is in a, is in a bad state, and at the same time, this bad state of the economy might uh, might also lead to uh, a pool of borrowers that is uh, more risky than during normal times, or uh, in general uh, a lower a lower demand for loans. Now, the way that we're go we're going to try to tackle these problems in in our paper is by trying to ensure that our treated and our control groups or high and our low deposit banks are uh, facing uh, very similar economic conditions and are, 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 are facing very similar um, borrowers are facing a very similar uh, demand for loans. So in order to do that, we take a number of steps. So first of all, we saturate our specifications with country year and industry year fixed effects in order to make sure that uh, borrower demand in, the, in these groups uh, that these different banks are facing is, is fairly, fairly similar. In some specifications, we're uh, even able to look at within firm year uh, variation, so which allow, allows us to even more properly control for, uh, for demand effects. In robustness checks, we'll then also look at uh, lending to borrowers outside of the euro, euro area because it's less likely that uh, the monetary policy uh, in the euro area reacts to economic conditions outside of the euro area. And also it's, it's less likely that the demand of these firms outside of the euro area is heavily impacted by uh, monetary policy decisions of the uh, ECB. And finally, we'll have a placebo test around July 2012, which is um, 
when rates were reduced but, all, but, but were still in positive territory. And there we will um, basically show that we have no uh, difference in the lending behavior between or risk-taking behavior between high and low deposit banks during, during this period. Again, showing that this, this impact of, of the deposit ratio is something that's very specific to, uh, to negative times. Okay, let me then uh, walk you through the, um, the main results in uh, the paper. So first of all, uh, the results on, uh, on bank uh, risk-taking. So the first four columns in this table show uh, regression results where on the left-hand side we have the, um, the profit volatility, so our main risk variable. So the period here is 2013 to 2015. Uh, we have monthly data on, on these loans, and uh, what these tables basically show is that we get, or what the first, volume, the first four columns basically indicate, is that there's a positive and significant uh, coefficient on the interaction term between the deposit ratio and the, uh, and the dummy equal to one during times of, of negative rates. So implying that indeed these high deposit banks seem to uh, take on more risk once rates become uh, negative relative to this group of, of low deposit banks. And this seems to be also uh, quite significant in, in economic terms because there we see that a one standard deviation uh, increase in the deposit ratio leads to a 16 to 90 per 19 uh, percent increase in, in loan risk depending on the exact uh, specification. So the, the only difference between the first four specifications in this table is that we gradually saturate the, uh, the regressions with, uh, with a set of, uh, of fixed effects. Now, um, in the, the fifth column of the table, we expand the sample period to 2011-2015, and this allows us to look at what's happening around uh, the reduction in rates in July 2012, so when rates were still positive. And there we see no uh, effect at all, or no difference at all, in the reaction between high versus low uh, deposit banks, uh, showing that this channel that we're describing is really something that's particular to times of, of negative uh, policy rates. In the last two columns, uh, we then look at the sample of non-Eurozone borrowers. And there we again see that for the Eurozone uh, lenders in that sample, there is an increase in risk taking for the, uh, for the high deposit banks, while we, do, while we don't see any effect if we, if we study loans to that same set of, of borrowers, uh, but loans coming from uh, banks outside of, uh, of the Eurozone, so banks that are not facing uh, an environment with uh, negative policy rates in their, in their, main, in their main market. Now, um, in the paper, we then um, have a number, of, uh, a number of robustness checks, so I'm not going to go through all of this here. Just, I mean, we, we for example, look at alternative uh, risk measures. We look at the shorter sample if you might be worried that um, the 2015 PSPP might be impacting our results. Uh, we look at uh, non-Eurozone lenders that, that are also facing negative rates. All these results basically uh, further confirm uh, this, uh, our finding on the on, uh, on bank risk taking. Now, for on the on the lending side, then so due to the fact that these high deposit banks uh, encounter a relative reduction in their net worth, we also expect them to to lend less. And we we look at this uh, from two uh, different perspectives. So first of all, uh, we look at total loan volumes at the bank month uh, at the bank month level. And there we already see that uh, indeed the, the loan volumes for the, the change in loan volumes for banks with a higher deposit ratio is, uh, is lower than for banks with a, with, a low, uh, with a low deposit ratio. Now, the potential problem with this, uh, with this type of setup, uh, of course, is that it's very hard to properly control for, uh, for demand effects given that we're running these regressions at the, at the bank, bank month level. So, an alternative uh, setup we can look at is uh, a setup where we further exploit the uh, granularity of the, uh, of the syndicated loan data we have available. So uh, in the syndicated loan data set, we have information of the different loan shares uh, of the different banks that are involved in, uh, in, a, syndicated, uh, in a syndicated loan. So we have uh, multiple banks uh, per loan. And we have also, uh, for some firms in our, in, our data, in our database, we have several new, lo new loans over the sample period to the same firm. So this uh, allows us to examine uh, a bank's loan share uh, in the syndicate while at the same time controlling for, uh, for, uh, for firm fixed effects. And when, uh, when doing that, we uh, first of all observe that high deposit banks indeed seem to keep um, hold, hold on to smaller uh, loan shares. So this is illustrated in the first two 
uh, columns of this table. So there we see that indeed ba banks with a higher deposit ratio seem to reduce their loan, share, uh, their loan shares. Most interestingly, in the last two columns, uh, we show that when we split up uh, our sample into uh, uh, risky and, and, and more safe uh, firms, that this reduction in uh, lending by these high deposit banks is uh, particularly coming from a reduction in lending to uh, to safe uh, to safe firms. So when you look at the sample of uh, of risky firms, you do not observe this reduction in lending. There, they're uh, effectively even increasing their uh, their loan share. So in in a way, this table com combines our results on the on the loan volumes and on on the risk taking. As we see, a, uh, <clears throat> a reduction in uh, lending or reduction in the loan shares for these high deposit banks for um, uh, for safe firms, while they shift towards the more risky firms or the more risky borrowers in our, uh, in our sample. Now a lot of, uh, so these are basically the main results for, for the paper and um, importantly if the channels that we've been, uh, that I've been discussing earlier on are really at work and are really driving this increase in risk taking and this relative reduction in lending, then you also uh, expect to see that there's a change in uh, net worth, effectively a change in net worth for these high versus these low deposit banks. And one way we can try to measure this is by, by looking at the stock returns of these uh, two groups of, uh, of banks. So this graph uh, shows the uh, evolution of a stock return index for uh, banks in the, so the listed banks in our sample in the top tercile of the deposit ratio distribution, so the solid line, and for the banks in the bottom tercile of the deposit ratio. And there again, we uh, effectively see a sharp reduction in the, uh, or a relative uh, gap opening, opening up in the evolution of the, of the stock returns for these two groups of banks. So high deposit banks seeing a relatively large reduction in their net worth around this, around this period, um, confirming that uh, indeed it might be these channels that, that are effectively at, uh, at work. Now, uh, as I mentioned in the paper, we then uh, tried to dig a bit deeper, and here I'm going to be very short on the, the additional results. There's a lot more information on this, on this in the paper. Just allow me to highlight two of these additional results. First of all, um, we see that um, uh, loan terms do not seem to be adjusted to reflect this higher risk of the borrower, so it seems to be really an increase in the, in the risk taking from the bank side. Uh, additionally, we also see an interesting interaction of the treatment with bank capitalization. So it seems to be that this effect on uh, bank risk taking seems to be uh, a lot stronger for banks with a, uh, a low capital ratio, which makes, uh, which makes a lot of sense, we think, given that these banks are more, um, I mean, agency problems will be uh, a lot more severe for these, uh, for these banks. And finally, we uh, tried to say something on, on the impact on, on the real economy, and there are um, a number of interesting results there are that risk-taking seems to be concentrated in private and not in publicly uh, listed firms. Uh, we also observed that new lending is not uh, going, to, uh, not going to, to zombie firms, so not particularly going to uh, firms which have very low profitability and were already borrowing from uh, the bank from which it's getting the, the new loan. And most interestingly, we see that the riskier borrowers that receive a loan effectively use this loan to increase, uh, to increase their, uh, their investments and not to, for example, start hoarding, uh, start hoarding cash. So overall, um, what, we, uh, what we conclude in this paper is that below zero, the transmission of monetary policy indeed seems to be somewhat different, and there seem to be some heterogeneous effects across different uh, types of banks. We also find that, so we find that there's a reduction in lending by, uh, uh, by high deposit banks and increase in their, uh, an increase in their uh, risk taking. We also see that uh, there seems to be a, short inc uh, a slight increase in lending to more constrained borrowers, and the, importantly, these constrained borrowers effectively use this, uh, these new funds to, uh, to invest. And finally, we also notice that there's some um, change in the matching between banks and firms, uh, and that goes like, um, and the, it implies that lending by high deposit banks seems to um, be going more to more risky borrowers and by low deposit banks to um, more safe borrowers. And one can then, of course, think about whether this matching is efficient and what, uh, what the potential implications are for, uh, for financial stability. So that's it from my side, and I'm very much looking forward to uh, Walter's discussion. You've been wonderful, even a few minutes less, so we will have more time for discussion. Thank you. Walter, the floor is yours. Great. Um, somebody going to put up the slides?
So I'm not sure I should thank the organizers for asking me to discuss the paper because somehow I ended up doing three discussions in an eight-day period. But the good news is, at least, is that it's a very nice paper. It, uh, it reads very well. It's uh, carefully crafted. Uh, and it's an incredibly important uh, topic. And so I'm actually not going to be that critical. I'm just going to raise some, uh, some, some big issue questions. Uh, but let's start at the beginning. So the objective is the paper is just to see is, is that how banks are going to respond if the policy rate gets, it, gets into uh, negative territory. Right? So over here I, I draw something downward sloping, but it also could be upward sloping. So the question is, is that is sort of the response fundamentally going to change if the policy rate gets negative? So that's the question. And as Glenn made clear in his uh, presentation is, is that that's a nasty identification problem and they have an incredibly interesting way to do it. And this is a graphical representation of uh, this identification assumption. So the data set covers two years from January 2013 to December 2015. And then in July 2014 we got into negative territory. And so the regression that they run is, is that it's the bank outcome and so there's three uh, subscript, so I is the firm, J is the bank, and then T is time. And then the idea is, is that they have these different banks and they differ in terms of how much they finance with uh, deposits. And then uh, they have a dummy for when it happens after the change into negative territory. So one thing I want to emphasize is that, right, so in their sample, it's only a six-month period when we had those, those negative uh, interest rates. So I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that. Okay, so what are the results? So these are quotes from the abstract. <clears throat> and so it says, if the interest rate gets negative, then it induces banks with more deposits to lend less to riskier borrowers, and banks do not adjust loan terms. Uh, so this seems incredibly scary, right? Because it's just, you know, they start uh, lending more to uh, riskier guys, and uh, it's not search for yield because they don't charge a higher in, you know, rate for that. It's just that they do it at the same raises before. So that seems a bit scary, um, and I'll get back to that too. Okay, so <clears throat> Glenn was actually careful during the presentation, and quite often in the paper they're quite careful too, but the way it reads is often the following, <clears throat> and that could very well, you know, one interpretation of the paper. So over here I have these bank responses, so in the top graph it's risk, and in the bottom graph it's lending. And so I have the deposit ratio. Over here, I draw a horizontal line in the benchmark. So before things get negative, that's just a normalization that could be upward sloping or downward sloping, right? Because the, yet we're going to look at the change. And so the way the, re the paper reads, like, like I just shown with the quote from the abstract, is, is that this is the interpretation they, they most seem to like. And that suggests this is that when we got into this negative territory, it says that these high deposit banks are on the right hand side of the graph. They started taking on more risk and overall banks started to lend less. Right? And, that's, that's and then the, the mechanism would be the following is, is that when the interest rate gets negative, then the problem is deposit rates, they cannot be lowered. And so that means that profits are going to go down and profits are going to go down and lending is going to go down. And this is especially the case for these high deposit banks. And then we're going to get more risk taking, I guess, because of the usual convex payoff, say, because of limited liability. Now, there's an incredibly interesting result because it's the opposite of what we usually think, right? So we usually think is, is that if the interest rate is going to go down, the rate on deposits is kind of sluggish. It doesn't move very much, but they get more on their, um, on the, on their assets, on their loans. And so lend, you know, lending actually would go up. It would be good for net worth. So it's, I mean, it's an absolutely fascinating kind of finding. Okay, so let's uh, start with a couple sort of simple clarifying questions. <clears throat> um, so a bank that has a low deposit ratio, that could mean that they have more interbank funding. And so when the interest rate gets negative, it's nice if you fund a lot of your assets, your loans, with interbank funding because, like we saw in the graphs, the only actually does get negative, right? So deposits, they're sort of stuck at the true zero lower bound. But the only gets it negative, so that's nice. However, I mean, maybe this is a dumb question because I don't know much, that much about bank balance sheets, but there's other possible funding, right? So there could be long-term funding, and that also will not change, right, if short-term policy rates are turning negative. 
so instead of looking at the deposit ratio, why not directly look at you know, the level of interbank funding? That seems to be a positive when interest rates get negative. Um, <clears throat> so that's a relatively minor comment. The other relatively minor comment is uh, the placebo. So again, a sort of a strength of the paper is that they show is, is that if you look at another event when the interest rate turned basically zero, is, is that we don't see any difference between the high deposit banks and the low deposit banks. I think it would be more interesting to look at the placebo during normal times where we actually expect the opposite, right? Is it that it's the large, uh, the banks with a large deposit ratio that benefit and actually would start lending more. Uh, but you know, these are relatively minor comments. Okay, so now <clears throat> I have sort of two, uh, two big picture kind of questions. And um, a long, long time ago, uh, way before the crisis, with my colleagues in San Diego, I had a paper on sort of behavior of lenders, of banks. And so there the story was is that how bank equity affects le lending. And then Tim Kehoe, you know, discussed our paper at an NS NSF conference, and I'm basically going to sort of copy his, uh, his, his way of uh, questioning the, the story. Uh, and so what is the actual nuts and bolts kind of story? How does it happen that if the ECB has these negative policy rates, that there's going to be less loans, right, by these high deposit uh, banks? And how does it happen that they actually take more risk? And how does that all happen within a six-month period? Okay, so <clears throat> you start with the ECB, and they have a negative interest rate. And so what's going to happen? So we're going to look at a typical bank. So a typical bank has an accountant, and so he's in charge of the money flows, right? And so he has to keep track of, you know, what he gets from the ECB or gives to the ECB, and so he has a negative interest rate on that. Okay, so then we have the depositor. <clears throat> And so you have this nice lady and this nice man, and we don't want to screw this nice lady. So if this nice lady gives money to the bank, is that we don't want to have negative interest rates on that. I'm perfectly fine with that. But what we're really interested in is, is that how this loan officer is going to change his behavior. Right? So what's happening in this six-month period when the ECB has this negative policy rate, that that guy, if he's at a high deposit bank, starts taking on more risk, and lending less, at least start lending le less overall, possibly more to, you know, to the risky guys. So there must be sort of anecdotal evidence, right, how that happens. And so what Tim Keogh said, he said, well, you know, I went to a bank yesterday and I told them I needed uh, a loan because I wanted to start an Italian restaurant. And so we sort of talked about what was important and his loan officer couldn't care less about the bank equity position of the bank. We know that, that somehow that cannot be true, right? Is it that somehow that's got to matter? And the same over here is the cost of funds, right? Or the alternative interest rates. That's got to matter for what this loan officer is going to do. But how does that happen? And how does that happen in a six month period that, right, when the ECB has a negative policy rate, <coughs> that someone who's loan officer is going to have a different schedule and sort of is going to change his behavior? Now, there may be a boss who's sort of shouting around over there what the guy should do. And so I struggled with that question a lot. And I sort of tried to look in you know, the banking literature is, is that, and there is actually quite a bit, right, on sort of you know, the behavior of loan officers. But you don't see these sort of these big picture things about sort of you know, the financial health of the bank, things like net worth and cost of funds for the bank sort of showing up. And over here, I think that's key. So we, right in our models, we think of this bank as like one person who maximizes something. But a bank are these, these, you know, these big, complex institutions. And so, how does that happen, this transmission within this institution that this loan officer, in a relatively short amount of time, really starts changing his behavior? Does he get instructions from the top and saying, well, no, by now you should take more risk? Um, okay. <clears throat> so that was my, uh, my first big question. <clears throat> so, like I showed you before, is, is that the paper reads a little bit as is that, well, you know, the banking sector overall is going to take on more risk. Um, and they're gonna lend less. But, I mean, Glenn was very careful in his presentation, and to be fair, is that they do point that out in the paper too. But nevertheless, is they, they seem to like the other uh, present, uh, interpretation more. Uh, at least that's the way I read the paper. But equally consistent with the literature is, is that, on average, there is not much change in the banking sector. Is, is that the high deposit 
ratio banks is that they're going to take more risk, but the low deposit ratio guys are actually going to take less. And this is also possible. Right? So the other possibility is, is that we actually get results which are more or less consistent with the standard story, is that there's going to be more lending. Right? Again, in this interpretation you see is, is that the high deposit banks, they lend less relative to the low deposit ratio banks. So this is a possibility too. Now what would be a possible story for this <coughs> interpretation of their results? Um, well, maybe these high deposit banks, they're small banks, and I think that's true, and they don't want to change the characteristics of their uh, loans that often. And so it's like a sort of habit, and so they're kind of sticky, and so they sort of stay where they were, and it's the low deposit ratio banks that sort of do the adjusting, and they sort of adjust in a relative way. Now you may say, well, why are they sort of, you know, lowering uh, risk because it's probably true even in this interpretation that met net worth goes down. Well, maybe banks have some kind of precautionary behavior too, is that man managers do not want to go bankrupt. And so when sort of, you know, the, the margin between the return on uh, liabilities and assets is going down is, is that they do start to take on less risk. <clears throat> okay, almost there. So that was sort of the, uh, the explanation. Um, but, but it may very well be is that, you know, the, that the first sort of interpretation is, is the one that happens, right? So let, let's take that for granted, and I have to admit, I find that, you know, somewhat more plausible than my own uh, interpretation on the last slide. So su suppose it truly is the case that when we got into negative territory, the banking sector as a whole, overall, was going to take on more risk and lend less. Then, of course, the question is, you know, why did the ECB lower interest rates into negative territory? Was it a good idea? So it doesn't sort of carry over into negative deposit rates for consumers, and so consumers are not directly affected. Uh, the other thing that I, I think we're beginning to realize is that whenever we have a reduction in the interest rate, it's usually temporary. And then we think the substitution effect is going to dominate. And the substitution effect is the same for a lender and a saver. Right? So that's why we think the, the reduction in the interest rate, that's going to be expansionary. But the interest rate has been low for a long time now. And so then the income effect becomes more important. And then the question is, is the income effect for the savers or for the borrowers going to be more important? Because it would have the, the opposite sign. And so I'm a saver, and I, I'm actually worried that the interest rate has been low for so long, and I expect it to be low for quite a while. And so for me, this reduction in interest rates actually had a contractionary effect because I worry about my pension. Uh, and since I have been at so many different in institutions, my pension plan is a mess, so savings is kind of important. And so if the return is so low, I mean, I feel I got to save more. All right, so suppose the authors Right? Results have to be interpreted in a way is, is that banks did not lend more overall. It's just that you know, the high deposit ratio banks and, and the high deposit ratio banks even lend to risky firms and it's not clear that was a smart investment. Then why did the central ECB do what they did? Is it through asset prices or exchange rates or other types of uh, rates that were affected by it? I think that's it. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you to both for your discipline and uh, also, anyway, clarity and conciseness in presenting this topic.